There are two scriptures I want to read to our hearing. Revelation 17 verse number 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. God was trying to uh, assist his prophet, his messenger, to understand a trend that was obtainable in society, to understand some political developments that were obtainable at the time that uh, in the then world, what God did to this prophet was that he took him high into the spirit. You see, are you with me? In order for you to know, maybe the person sitting by your side, the person is looking powerful with a good tunic and raiment. Sometimes, in order for God to show you what is close to you, he might need to take you deeply, high in the spirit. And that was what happened to Apostle John. Apostle John saw the cause of the trends and the patterns and the departures away from God. He saw that it was a woman a harlot, a spiritual harlot that was responsible for the seductions that had taken place and for the patterns that have emerged in that time. Second scripture. Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 21 beginning from verse number 10. Revelation 21 beginning from verse number 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and twelve gates, and at the gates were twelve angels, the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Hallelujah. You are not following me. I say, Hallelujah. This second city that we speak about is still captured within the context of a feminine metaphor. This is a bride. This city is like a bride that is adorned for her husband. And there are a lot of metaphorical expressions in the Bible. For instance, Jesus was the one that said, Ye are the light of the world. Do you believe that? You are not following this my lecture. I said, for instance, Jesus was the one that said, He are the light of the world. Do you believe that? 
He didn't stop there. Jesus also said, Ye are a city that is set upon an hill that cannot be hid. You are aware, I know you know the light of the world, but many of us do not know the city. That you, seated here, you are a city, you are a civilization that God is hoping to pioneer upon the face of the earth. It is that city which the bride of Christ is, which is a civilization that is domiciled in the heavens and the Bible reveals that it is coming down from heaven. It is that city that the Bible calls the bride of Christ. So we have two women in metaphoric speech. The first one is a harlot. The second one is a bride. And these two metaphors are civilizations that are domiciled in the realm of the spirit seeking expression among men. These cities represent two irreconcilable extremes that are available in the realm of the spirit. These cities are expressions of different civilizations that are obtainable in the realms that they exist looking desperately for how they can find expression in the world of men. These cities are traceable to different origins. Now, let's go further. Can you draw a table so that we can analyze the cities? If we do this analysis properly, we are likely to find out which of the cities your life is projecting, your life is advertising. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Yes, the class is coming up now. The name of the first city that I read about in the book of Revelation chapter 17 is called Babylon the Great. So you can put Babylon in one column. The name of the second city is called the New Jerusalem. So you can put the New Jerusalem in another column as we begin our analysis. Because your life is either a manifestation of Babylon or it is a manifestation of the New Jerusalem. If we finish this analysis, you will know where you stand. Are you there? Yeah. See, my brother that just finished ministering is mobilizing us for the field, mobilizing us for missions, mobilizing us to take responsibility so that the full scope of return on investment and profit can be achieved on the strength of the death of Jesus. My own assignment is to the body of Christ, this army that is seated here. We are going to lack full capacity utilization if there are men and women among us that are reflective of Babylon. We will need to conduct a transportation, a translocation, so that we can ultimately fill the gap of missionary manpower. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. If by any means we take a Babylonian and send to a village, the first item under Babylon is that Babylon is a harlot. For Babylon, anything goes. You can do anything to make money. You can do anything to get money. You can do anything to get admission. You can do anything to get employment. That is harlotry. It means you are a Broadway. It means you can take any shape. You can take any color. You can take any texture as occasion demands if it will generate self-profit. That's how Babylon is. Babylon is a harlot. 
But you see, the new Jerusalem is a bride. And I'm, are you there? And the excellency of the new Jerusalem is his chastity, his devotion and loyalty to her Lord. So, the thing about the new Jerusalem is that uh, those whose lives are manifesting the civilization of the new Jerusalem are shaped by their devotion, by their loyalty, by their exclusivity in ministering to the needs of their Lord. You see, are you there? Whereas one is a harlot, it's available. The other one has straight qualities of loyalty, of dedication, and submission. To one. And the whole idea of the covenant that occasioned her a bride requires absolute dedication and devotion. Your absolute dedication and devotion to Christ is going to shape you and is going to present you as a different entity other than just any other person on the streets. If it is true that you are the bride, your devotion to Christ is going to shape your outlook. For instance, when you study the Bible, you are going to find in the book of Acts chapter 6, when there was an administrative challenge and the administrative challenge was about a certain set of widows feeling marginalized in the daily distribution. It was a legitimate administrative situation that needed urgent attention. But you see, the apostles understanding their role and understanding the objective of their service delivery knew that they were condemned, they were sentenced to the ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. That was the sentence that Jesus placed upon them. So even though there was a legitimate need, they could not leave the designation of that sentence to go and attend to legitimate matters. If the Bible says that we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, it's just like an Ezemo. The man that became an Ezemo was picked out of the society and then released to a, a spirit, a shrine. In the next five years, that guy is going to be shaped by his interaction, his exclusive dedication, his exclusive devotion to that spirit. It, it will change his outlook to life. It will change his approach to life. It will make him different. Are you with me? Now, if these guys continue continually in prayer, continually in the ministry of the world, this devotion will shape them. Will make them different from ordinary people that do not have this level of devotion. So when we talk about the bride, your loyalty and your exclusivity with Jesus is expected to shape you and make you a kind of person that is not a common kind of person that you find on the streets. That's number one. Number two. Babylon is a great city. Great city. So much of economic traffic taking place in the city. It means there's a lot of sales going on. There's a lot of economic traffic taking place. Let me give you a scripture. Revelations. Revelations chapter 18. Are you there? 
Let's begin from verse 9. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall be, bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for the fear of her torment saying alas alas that great city Babylon that mighty city for in one hour is thy judgment come and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buy it their merchandise anymore the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all tine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and bees and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and the souls of men. So there's a lot of economic traffic. And the idea behind the traffic is to seduce you to think that you are actually prospering, you are advancing, you are getting something, you are migrating. But unknown to you, the idea is indulgence to get you to participate with the field that is in the trade. I don't have time to take you to the book of Ezekiel and to show you the angel of commerce. The angel of commerce believes, and meanwhile, that's another name for the devil. Because the Bible identified him in the book of, of um, Ezekiel chapter 28 that is involved in trade. For instance, if you receive an impartation of lust, what it means is that you are for sale. That loss is likely to move you into action. The moment you engage action from that loss, you have given Satan authority over your life for a season. Oh, you are not there. In the book of Zechariah, you are going to see some angels that are equipped with measuring instruments. And they, they, have, they, they are busy 24 hours. The moment you yield to God, you have gained more territory. They'll measure the new territory. Then when you fornicate, you have lost territory. Then you steal, you lose more. You, the reason why the angels are active is because we are not stable. We are moving like, like this. Meanwhile, this angel of commerce is trying to seduce you to think that you are on a campaign of profit. Meanwhile, he wants you to experience contamination. So that you can have a harvest from your life. So it's a great city. But on the other hand, the new Jerusalem is a holy city. The description of this city is that it is holy. Hallelujah. What does it mean of holy? Who can help us from the congregation? Holy. Is this a state of being pious, sanctimonious, or sacramental? Please. Oh, so this is your murmuring is the answer. What is the meaning of holy? Yeah? Purity. That's the meaning of holy. Okay? Somebody says set apart. Okay? No, that's what somebody said. Alright? Any other one? Alright. How many of you have a computer, a laptop, desktop, an iPad, 
a tablet, a cell phone. Now, if you have a cell phone, this your cell phone is capable of running various applications. And I know that all of us in this place, you have a lot of applications on your cell phone. Is that true? So, you have an application that can make your cell phone a calculator. You have an application that can make your cell phone a television. You have an application that can make your cell phone whatever you want it to be. It means that the cell phone is like a womb that can take in applications and produce them when you want to put them to use. Is that clear? Is that the truth? All right. So imagine a cell phone that has only one application. Not because it cannot run other applications, but it has only one application by choice. The way you are now, you are like a cell phone. You are capable of fornication, adultery, you are capable of theft, you are capable of terrible things, but you decide that, are you there? Are you with me? You decide that this, my own computer, is only the Holy Spirit that will be installed in it and will run it. Even though I have potential to be an instrument that the devil will use to manifest his will, I decide to be exclusive to the Holy Ghost, that only the Holy Spirit will run my system. It will interest you to know. Are you there? That we have other softwares. In fact, the book of Revelation captures like five major softwares that can run your life. One is sin. If you check those churches, you will find the ailments that John, through prophetic insight, was able to locate in those churches. You are not following me. Sin can be a software that can run your life. These are softwares that the devil is trying to make available so that, you know, your life can run other programs apart from Holy Ghost program. And there are some programs that if you initialize, even when you change your mind and you want to stop it, it is booting. You don't, your, you, you don't have your will. You cannot choose not for the thing not to run because already it was engaged. So it's booting. It's initializing. Even if you change your mind, you can't change it. It must boot out. So Satan wants to run your life on other softwares like sin, like self. You live for yourself. Like the world, you live to be in the satisfactory books of the world. He has a lot of things with which he's hoping to entice you. But what it means to be holy is that you are a dedicated individual that runs on only one software, even though you are capable of running on multiple softwares. Did you get my illustration? So it's not as if God will kill all the beautiful ladies because you are in, in Enugu. But a holy man chooses that those beautiful ladies will not be used to run him. He is dedicated to God. He is, can only be operated by the Holy Ghost. He only accepts the desires of the Holy Spirit to have free course in his vessel. So that his life is an expression of the definition of the influence that he has allowed to be propagated through his vessel. The only way the Holy Ghost can be known is when we have a dedicated vessel that is possessed by him and that allows him to walk. Then you'll be able to identify the ways of the Holy Ghost through that which he does through that vessel. The Bible reveals that the new Jerusalem is a holy city. Only God can operate within it. 
I'm saying this. Hallelujah. I'm saying this because we are in strange times. And the devil is seeking to smuggle in the system of Babylon into the practice of everything so that the civilization that is powered by his wisdom, that's the only creation of Satan, Babylon. He wants you to operate within the civilization called Babylon. Are you there? It is possible for a local assembly to be operating with the civilization of Babylon. And when people attend that local assembly, they are, the doctrine, the teaching builds the infrastructure of Babylon so that the person becomes a harlot. I'm saying that a, a church can be one of the extensions of Babylon. And anyone that is a member of that church is being taught on how to fulfill all the attributes of Babylon. Meanwhile, it has a name that is good. It has a pastor. But the pastor himself is a Babylonian. And these are two concurrent civilizations that are available now. You will decide how you operate. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Number three, Babylon is common. Those of you that are champions of the Old Testament, you understand the meaning of common. And the New Jerusalem is separated. Revelation chapter 21 verse 2. I need to explain what separated is. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then jump to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Verse 12. 12. And had a great wall, the first infrastructure that was revealed in this civilization is the wall which is suggestive of separation. They are not following me. The wall. If you have new eyes and new lenses through the scriptures, you can actually see a pastor and know this one is Babylon. The first infrastructure mentioned in that city is war. Meaning that the citizens of this civilization are separated. Hmm. Oh my God. Now there is something we call detachment. I don't have time for definition of terms. Detachment. Then the first term I was supposed to define, which I cannot define, is detachment. The second term I was supposed to define, which I cannot define, is distinctiveness. Because are you there? You are distinct. You are not a mixture. 
even though you make contact, but because you are distinct, you are not contaminated. drinking or eating. That means John the Baptist's approach to escaping the world system was that we separate, we segregate. But you see, segregation is not separation. He came neither eating nor drinking. They say he had a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking. They still gave the son of man a name, but Jesus modeled the example of contact without contamination. He was detached from the corruption. He was distinct from the corruption. If you exercise, if your life is descriptive of separation, the end product is that you should be distinct and detached. So you can actually be a politician contest for an election and when people say, you know, we need to bribe the IRO, we need to bribe the so, so, and so, you are detached from it. Right? You may not even win the election, but what you have done is that you have shown that you are distinct. You are different from the Babylonian system. It's an, it's an advertisement for the kingdom of God. Until it becomes clear that these two cities abide distinctively in our land. Not a mixture of both. Not a, 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 a system of blending. When we say something is common or something is separated, I need to tell you the difference. If you take a goat and you take it to an Izemo in a shrine and say, I dedicate it to the spirit. Are you there? It means that that goat has been isolated from every other use that it, it, it could be put to in society. The only use it has now is the use in the shrine. You there? You are not following. If I go to the market and I buy 10 cups and I take two out of the 10 cups and take it to the temple and the priest accepts it and anoints it, it is no longer common. It can no longer be used for, the, it's the same cups, but it can no longer be used for the same purpose that the eight other cups will be put to. The only use this cup has is a use to which it can be put in the temple because it is dedicated. The other cups are called common. This one is called dedicated. So we have common men. The citizens of Babylon operate that way. They are common. But one that has been dedicated to God in the temple only has, can only operate according to the allowance that the temple regulations provide. So the common man can see a lady and say, hey, this one, they, what you see, the dedicated men can only see that lady in the light of how she's supposed to operate according to the regulations of the temple. Babylon is a civilization that is hoping to conquer you. The new Jerusalem is a civilization that is, God is expecting that you will promote upon the face of the earth to reveal his distinctiveness 
through your life of detachment. Finally, in the analysis, Babylon is in the wilderness. But the new Jerusalem is on a high mountain. Hallelujah. Not just on a mountain, but what? Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 from verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torment and those that were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those which had the palsy and he healed them and they followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. 5 verse 1. Because of the miracles he did, multitudes followed him. If you read chapter 5, you will see that it's a continuum. And chapter 5 verse 1 saying, and seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. Now, I was expecting that when Jesus now saw all the multitudes coming from Decapolis, coming from, um, let me read, coming from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. I was expecting that Jesus would start a crusade. Verse 5, verse 1. What did Jesus do? Seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. He raised the standard. So he raised the standard so that people that are willing to pay a price to receive what he wanted to give, will now be the people that will arrive at the mountain top. Guess what? At the end of the day, only his disciples were willing to go up. <laughs> the multitude still remained down. They say, how can you inconvenience us? You can't inconvenience us. Now we came for comfort. We hear you give people food. We hear you do all kinds of stuff. So that's what we came for. You now say, we should start climbing mountains. The new Jerusalem has standards. Standards that are high. Standards that are heavenly. It is an abomination for members of the new Jerusalem to manifest in such a way that Babylonians will even wonder you know, when we become lower than Babylon, we don't have what it takes to win Babylon because our character, our disposition, the fruit that we bear is a contradiction with the things that we say we have received. So Jesus decided to raise the standard. Now the question is this. If it will cost you something to follow Jesus, will you still be there? Someone wants to marry you, but the person says he wants to test you, to test your fertility. To see if you are viable. Will you still go ahead with the wedding arrangement? The person is trying to give you a passport, a Babylonian passport, at the edge of the marriage covenant. So we have to test your viability. Hallelujah. I know the amen won't be loud at, that, at this point. No. Babylon is in the wilderness. 
But the new Jerusalem is where? On the mount. So these are two irreconcilable realities. They are expressions of different civilizations desperately looking for expression upon the face of the earth. Are you there? I will drop you one more item. There are seven items I was supposed to reveal to you. And these seven items are drawn from the true two trees that you find in the Garden of Eden. One of them is illustrative of Babylon, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the other one is illustrative of the tree of life. It's illustrative of the new Jerusalem, which is the tree of life. There are seven different things that we need to pay attention to. If you want to live, you want to function as the new Jerusalem. But, because of my time, I will mention one, you study six. Hallelujah. Just like there were two trees, number one, there are two sources. So I will stop at sources. Come with me to the book of John chapter 8 verse 44. There are seven things that you can use to judge a man. Judge a ministry. Judge a nation. Judge a government. To know if the government is Babylonian. To know if that man is Babylonian. The man can say he's born again, but this... These seven factors will show whether he's born again, but he has multiple entry visa to Babylon. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, rebuking the doctors of the law. This is his comment. He said, ye are of your father the devil. Now, if you have a lexicon, an electronic Bible that sustains a pilot number, click on off. Ye are off. You will see the word there is ek. And that's the same word in ekliaza. That ek means out of. It means source. It means you derive. So it's the source that Jesus is probing. You are not with me. You see, when someone functions in the gift of discernment of spirit or he functions in discernment, the person probes beyond face value and enters into source. In discernment, we do not stay at face value. We probe into source. Oh my. I can't deviate. I can't bring another scripture. So Jesus says, ye are ek, ye derive from your father, the devil. Ye originate from your father, the devil. So when Jesus wants to probe something, the first thing he probes is source. The ministry can look powerful. The ministry can look mighty. The followership can be splendid. But Jesus is not concerned about that. He is concerned about what? Ek, source. So the first probe is the probe of source. Ye are off your father, the devil. So now that Jesus has concluded that they are off the devil, then you now see the things of the devil, they have their function by the things of the devil. And the loss of your father, ye will do. Are you seeing? Loss. The desires of your father. The explanation of why they will fulfill the desires of their father is because they are ek. They are what? From. They can be traced to that source. 
He said he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. You will now know that one of the major characteristics of the devil is that he never abides in the truth. Someone that is of the new Jerusalem, when you confront the person with the truth, that the person is violating, the person will repent. Because in the new Jerusalem, the authority that is obtainable in that space is the authority of the word of God, the authority of the light. But when you, when, you see, the Bible says we cannot do anything. If you decide to deny the truth, you will be damned. Because you can't fight the truth. You can't do anything against the truth. But when you find a man confronted with the truth and that man tries to, you know that the, it is an issue of source. Oh, you are not following. I'm, I, I'm, you see, my, I'm making an attempt to take us on a journey of basic discernment along seven lines to know whether something has its roots in Babylon. Whenever you see these characteristics, murder, it is only the thief that comes. This thief, are you there? It's called a thief. Eh? But it doesn't only steal. This spiritual thief kills too. It's, they call him thief. But he is capable of killing, he's capable of destruction. It is only that thief that is a master of murder. It brings to an end something that has a promising possibility. So many people have been, have been victims of murder. It's not as if they are dead. But there is destruction has been factored into their lives and the possibility of them attaining to their previous state will only take the hand of God. That's what Babylonians do to people. The Bible says that this devil does not abide in the truth. He never abode in the truth. Anytime he was confronted with the truth, he looks for a way of escape. He doesn't accept the authority of the truth. doesn't accept the, to be disciplined by the truth. He said because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh a lie, beware of people that are fluid with lies, slimy people. It means they have no king. So we need to probe beyond face value, beyond the texture of the suit, beyond the nature of the bow tie, and probe to find the source. Because Jesus is concerned about source. Matthew chapter 15 verse 12 and 13 and I'll be done. Matthew 15, 12 and 13. Then his disciples came and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? This is a feedback. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted. He didn't say should, but he said shall. It means that there are plantings that are not of God. And this was the metaphor that Jesus used when he confronted the Pharisees with the truth. And instead of the Pharisees repenting at the sight of the truth, they became offended by the truth. What did Jesus say? Every plant, it means in that metaphor, the plant he was talking about are, are men. And the way you will know the men that God will uproot are men that do not line up with the truth. It's a proof of your source. It's a proof that you might, you are professing to be of God, but you draw your essence from Satan. Who is the one that never abode in the truth? Are you, are you good? Just in case you inherited a lying spirit, it is something you need to fast and go to God's presence about. 
and ask him to destroy it because it's not God's nature. These things that we pamper are the things that are responsible for our ultimate corruption. And even though God wants to apply you to a noble use, you don't have the capacity to produce the fruits of nobility because of the contamination that has come that you have allowed. Listen to me. Jesus, in educating us, gave us a lecture on kingdom lifestyle. And it is in the book of Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. In summary, what he said in those chapters is that a Christian, a kingdom man, operating under the government of God, is supposed to be mercifully kind towards others. Secretly pure toward God. Not publicly pure, secretly. He has a deal with God. The screen that monitors his compliance to purity is his intercourse with God. Are you there? He's mercifully kind towards others, secretly pure toward God, and righteously strict toward himself. That's the summary of Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7. The Christian, the kingdom lifestyle. Toward others, we see mercy flowing out of you and compassion. Toward God, there is a secret that you have with God, which is your purity connection. Under the such light of heaven, you stand without condemnation. And concerning yourself, you are supposed to be what? Eh? Righteously strict. So that your life doesn't become a contradiction to the things that you have preached. That was what Paul says when he said that I beat my body, I put it in subjection. So that when I preach to others, I myself will not become a castaway. It is possible for me to have preached powerfully and then I manifest and exhibit the characteristics of a Babylonian. In order for this not to happen, I will put pressure on myself to stay in discipline. It is it's not sweet. Satan wants to make you a liar. That your life is a contradiction so that your authority cannot be recognized in the realm of the spirit. A believer must be righteously what? Strict. As a pastor, I don't know how you run your office. How you run your office. If you are righteously strict to yourself, there's a way you will run it that will make it difficult for anything to happen. All this looseness. Everywhere, there's compromise in high and low places when you check the name is a Doris. Doris is Mary. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Three things I need to say quickly on the two sources. Number one, the source both determines the way and the result. The result you will get, the method you will use, will be determined by your source. If your source is Jesus, if your source is the Holy Ghost, there are some strategies that you cannot even consider. But if your source is not Jesus, if your source is not the Holy Ghost, it will be revealed in the strategies you adopt to accomplish your objective. The source will determine the way, determine the method, and determine the result. That's the first point. Second point. To take God as your source is to follow the narrow way that leads to life. You see, if God becomes your source, your options are not many. If you are in marriage and there is 
crisis in the marriage. Because there will be misunderstanding. No matter how anointed both of you are. If there's crisis in the marriage, the options are not... Have you realized the options are not many? You can even get angry. But you know that the options are not... They are not many. So, if you, if you know that the options are not many, the way you, you will react will be impacted by that knowledge that I can't drive her. I can't date another woman. A side chick outside is not in the matter. I can't travel abroad and patronize. So, what will I do? Before sun goes down, the sun goes down. Even if you will go near and say, are you, are you seeing, are you? They, it is not because may the Lord help us. <laughs> it is not because you want to, you, you see this, the source you are operating on has already limited your options. <laughs> has limited your options. So you will now discover that shouting is not even profitable if you understand your source and the options. No need to shout. But this is what happens. Sometimes keeping quiet is very powerful. Just. <laughs> Go by Sally. Uh, the reason why we are operating like that is because of our source. When you find a man say, I have an irreconcilable situation between me and this woman. Huh? His source has changed. In fact, for him to have the confidence to say that, the, anything this hand means is true. Please help me tell your neighbor the options are not many. <laughs> Even when people come and lie against you and insult you, the option, because of the options are not many. You can't fight. No, God will not bless your fight. So you will now learn how to cast your cares. Don't, you would have killed him, but ah, that's not the way. We, we don't have that option available to us on the path we are following. Hey, how I wish they had killed, kill. Oh! But they didn't add it. So you can't kill him. Huh? So you will learn how to cast your cares upon him. That's the way we offload. Because we are not allowed to vent it on this part. <laughs> what has constrained you is your source. For the Bible says that the spirit of God, he, what? He constraineth us. He puts us on a narrow path where the options are not many. Finally, as I go, God is concerned about the source. Many of you will see Isaac and see Ishmael and think it's the same. But one is a product of the flesh. It's a product of the will of man. It's a product of human wisdom. The other one is the product of the promise of God. In fact, the time the other one came... The ability to operate in the flesh in that manner was no longer available. It was the Holy Spirit of God himself that made the possibility of Isaac available. So when you see two of them standing, a carnal man will say, two children. The first one shall carry the birthright. But the Holy Ghost revealed that Ishmael did not have the wiring to be the custodian of the weight of the glory that accompanies the birthright of the family. The reason was because of his source.
Isaac came because of a prophetic word. It was that prophetic word that, that, that vitalized the body of Abraham that was dead. It was that prophetic word that vitalized the, the deadness of Sarah's womb. Made, made it alive. The creature that came out of that womb after that miracle was supernatural. And it was only him that had the stature to contain the weight of the glory that accompanied the covenant of that house. God is concerned about the source. So you will hear God make statements like, Ishmael shall not be thy heir. Then you say, Kai, God is wicked. No, source. 